deixa-me só ligar o Kiko. Já está? Deixa-me só ligar o Kiko. Está a pessoa ficar sem bateria amanhã. Eles, perguntei a eles só se podem falar, só para testar. Um, can, you do, can we talk so we could test the sound? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's okay for my sound? Yeah. Okay. All good. Um, are we ready? Can we start? Can we start the presentation? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I can listen to you, John. <laughs> okay. Nice chair behind you. <laughs> Everyone is hearing and it's uh, streaming right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll try and share the screen. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna do. It. I'm just gonna do a brief presentation about the activity. Okay. Okay. Boa tarde a todos. Um, obrigado por terem uh, vindo a e participado na, jornada, na nona edição das Jornadas de Civil. Uh, é com muito prazer hoje que podemos contar com o engenheiro João Nós Barnig e o engenheiro Milton Moraes uh, para a apresentação da, da conferência Construction of CERN Accelerators, da LHC e da Futuristic SCC e do Alumi Project. So, um, então, sem mais demoras, Uh, vou passar a palavra ao engenheiro John Osborne. You can start now. If you give me access to share the screen, please. Okay. Okay. So can you see that? Uh... Mm -hmm. I go full screen. That's okay. Okay. And can you hear me okay? Can you hear yes. me okay? It's working? Yes, yes. Good. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for um, this opportunity for, for us to present CERN's uh, civil engineering project. So, um, as mentioned, I'll be giving a quick introduction to, to CERN and our geology, and then talking about previous past civil engineering projects, including the Large Hadron Collider. And then Milton will take over for the works that are going on now for the upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider called High Luminosity LHC. And then it'll come back to me for the, for the future, our well, future studies, including the 100 kilometer future circular collider that we're studying now, and maybe some other, other studies if we have time. So I'm a, a civil engineer uh, from the UK, worked for a contractor, tunneling contractor for 10 years and then joined CERN uh, 24 years ago to work on the Large Hadron Collider, in particular the CMS uh, project, which I'll refer to in a second. So first of all, introduction to CERN. So CERN's all about um, physics research to push back the frontiers of, of knowledge, to develop new technologies. And a very important part of CERN's mission is to train scientists and engineers of, of tomorrow. And in fact, CERN employs 10 times more engineers and technicians than it does physicists. So we'll, I'll come back at the end and I'll mention opportunities for jobs and, and, and uh, experience, work experience at CERN. And a big part of CERN is to unite people from different countries and cultures. In fact, one of the main objectives of why CERN was started was after the Second World War to get physicists working together on a peaceful project, which is even more uh, relevant today, of course. So CERN um, was founded in 1954, originally with 12 member states. Now we have about 23 member states, of course, including uh, Portugal and a budget of about uh, 1.2 billion Swiss francs per year and about 2,700 staff. But it's a global uh, a collaboration. You can see all the countries that contribute, and uh, we work together with all over the world uh, on CERN physics projects. So that's what it looks like. This is um, Geneva Airport on the bottom to give you the scale, you can see. And then the tunnel itself straddles the border uh, several times between France and Switzerland. The Jura Mountains are in, in the background. The dotted line is the, is, the, is the border between France and Switzerland. So that's the Large Hadron Collider. So as you can see, it, it goes across the border quite a few times. And we have the four um, what we call detectors on the LHC, CMS, ALICE, ATLAS and LHCB. And that's where the particles are made to collide. 
So that's what's in the tunnel. A large hadron collider. There's basically a vacuum tube, tube with uh, lots of service in the tunnel, cryogenics, power supplies, etc. that circulate the physics particles around the two directions, and then they're made to collide inside these very large caverns. This is one of them uh, for the. It's called the CMS detector, which is the one I worked on. I'll come back to in a second. You probably heard about the Higgs boson discovery. Uh, a, few yeah, a few years ago. Years ago. So, on, so on the civil engineering, engineering, so our so geology our is, uh, is quite good. That's one of the reasons why CERN was picked uh, to house the, the CERN facilities because the, the rock is quite good. It's fairly stable. We have about um, the LHC is 27 kilometers long, on average 50 to 175 meters deep, and we have a mixture of what's called molasses and limestone rock. But there's more there's than 70, 70 kilometers of tunnels and more than 80 caverns at CERN. It's not it's just, just the Large Hadron Collider. There's many uh, tunnels leading up to the Large Hadron Collider. It starts, uh, the beam starts close to what's called the PS, which was built in 1959. And CERN gradually expanded, got bigger and bigger, and deeper and deeper. So the SPS was built next, then the LEP, and then the Large Hadron Collider. And now I think it's an even bigger machine, uh, but using this injection chain to inject into the new, new facilities that we're considering now. So this is our main geological units. We have the moraines, the glacial deposits that we have to go through first for the, for the shaft construction to get down to either molasses or limestone rock. So the molasses is, is generally a good rock, it's, but it's very variable. It can be a very um, hard sandstone with a compressive strength similar to concrete, about 40 or 50 megapascals, but then going down to a very, very weak marl, um, and it changes very rapidly, the geology. But it's generally dry, and a stable rock, but it does need quite a lot of support because of the, the weak, weak layers that we get. And there is a risk of swelling, creep, and uh, squeezing. The limestone we consider to be a bad, a bad rock for tunneling because in this region we have a risk of karstic features with underground uh, cavities, like this, like this image on the bottom right. So that's representing the risk of doing a new tunnel and you come across one of these karstic features and you have a risk of water ingress in the tunnel, which we saw during the, the LEP and the LHC construction with the risk of water and sediments coming in, which are difficult to, um, to pump out. So we try and stay in the molasses rock as much as possible. So the LEP is the, the tunnel that was built in the 1980s, the grey 27 kilometres, and then the red was built at the end of the 1990s. So, so that's when I came to CERN for the, what's called uh, the CMS detector cavern at 0.5. But there's also a work site at point one for the Atlas detector, several injection tunnels and tunnels dotted around the ring, and also buildings up on the surface. Lots of new buildings were constructed for the LHC project to convert the LEP into the LHC uh, machine. The tunnel itself is inclined about 1.4%, the whole 27 kilometre tunnel. And the reason for that is to keep the tunnel as much as possible in this what we consider to be good molasses rock, to minimise the amount of tunnelling in the, in the limestone rock, and to minimise the depth of the tunnels as much as possible. So it's basically sloping down from the Jura Mountains towards the airport that you saw in the earlier, earlier photograph. So to convert the LEP tunnel to the LHC, it was a substantial amount of civil engineering. We had to build six new shafts. We had to build um, 32 new caverns. Uh, and about half a million meters cubed of, of, of rock was excavated to convert the, the old LEP tunnel into the LHC tunnel. And it was all the member states of CERN uh, have, have the right to tender uh, for, the, for these contracts. And this is how we split up the works of the Large Hadron Collider. We had four big, big contracts. And we're very traditional at CERN. We have uh, normally consultants and contractors. So it's full design by the consultants and the contractors execute the design uh, by the consultants. So it's a very similar, Milton will come back to in a minute for the, for, for the high, luminos high luminosity LHC. So you can see the different uh, co consultants and contractors we had. So for example, the one I was, I was working on was 0.5 CMS. We had a British company, Gibbs, Geo Consultant Austrian and a Swiss consultant to do all the design and project management. And there was a Spanish contractor, Dragadas, with an Italian contractor called um, Selly. For the excavation of the tunnels, we use um, either rock breakers, because the rock is fairly soft, so hydraulic hammers, tunnel boring machines, if it's a longer tunnel, or a road header for the smaller caverns and, uh, and galleries. We did not use any explosives for the Large Hadron Collider. It was considered to, to take too long, basically, to, to stop all the activities, to install all the explosives for, for little gain. Where it, but we, it's much quicker just to use a rock breaker or a, or a road header type machine. So that's more detail what was done for the CMS in red. So again, the, le the LEP tunnel is in white. So for CMS, we had to build two new shafts, two new caverns, one very big cavern to house the detector and a service cavern with a, with a bypass tunnel to allow transport from one side of the, of the CMS detector to the other side. 
And that's what it looked like when we, when we started in 1999. You can see the uh, just about see the two shafts in the photograph uh, and the building on the surface. So we took the decision early on to build the building immediately, but to, to have the shafts is like an independent work site. So the building was complete, completed and then handed over to CMS to start pre-assembly the detector and then to install the detector once the shafts shafts were finished. You can see for environmental purposes, we built a special uh, special road. All of the rock that was excavated was landscaped on the site. Uh, nothing, nothing left the site, in fact, for the, uh, for the excavation works. Uh, we had a few issues. We came across a, a Roman villa in the, during the excavation of the, of the works, but luckily it wasn't on the location of the shafts. So it didn't interfere with our, with our works, but it's uh, quite an interesting villa that was discovered. There's, a, there's another photograph showing, showing the two shafts. The building's now complete by 2001. And CMS are working inside this building. And the high luminosity site that Milton will talk about in the minute in the minute is all down the, the bottom of this picture. So to excavate the two shafts, we had to use um, the ground freezing technique because we had about 50 or 60 meters of these glacier deposits before we got to the to the good uh, good rock. So we decided to use ground freezing, which is drilling uh, free, freeze pipes from the surface all the way down to the to the rock, down 60 meters, and then circulating salty water, brine at minus 23 degrees C, until the water in the ground started to freeze around these pipes, until eventually after a few months, you had three meters of ice all the way around the shaft, where you could excavate in dry and stable conditions. So that's the freeze pipes being drilled. This is the refrigeration plant on the right hand side. So it's a closed system. There's pipes coming from the refrigeration plant going down, down these freeze pipes back up again to the plant. So we're not injecting anything into the ground. It's the existing groundwater that freezes around these pipes. So all the indications were after six months that we could start excavating in dry and stable ground. You can see the ice on the top of these pipes around the, around the shaft. We started excavating. Unfortunately, uh, there was a problem. There was water coming in at quite a high velocity. So we had to um, backfill the shaft and uh, come up with a new idea. So then we started injecting liquid nitrogen down these freeze pipes. There was lorry loads of liquid nitrogen coming to the site to give the wall a boost, which was eventually successful. We closed the wall, the ice wall, and then we continued the excavation. But we also had to do a bit of um, a bentonite slurry wall to stop the, the groundwater attacking these two shafts. But eventually it was, uh, it was success successful. Then we could continue excavation inside these um, uh, the ground freezing frozen walls. Then we could slip form the shafts, so it's a continuous platform from the from the bottom going up to concrete the lining of the shaft. And then we we turned off the switch switched off the ground freezing and started with the shaft excavation. You can see here the uh, the lift access we had down the shaft and the start of the excavation of the of the caverns. So there's the two shafts finished. Uh, one is 12 meters in diameter, the other is 20, the big one for lowering the detector. And we realized the problem was with the ground freeze and these shafts are very, very close together. And the water was coming from, from up the top of this picture coming down and it was accelerating in between these two shafts because the, the fact the ice wall didn't work on the two sides where they were getting basically underground rivers were getting forced through this narrow dam, if you like, in the river. And this is where we had the problems. But eventually it was um, successful and we could start the excavation of the shafts using a, a traditional rock header type uh, machine. This is the molasses rock you can see at the bottom. So another big issue we had at CMS was that we only have 20 meters of rock over the top of the caverns. And they're two very large caverns. That's the LHC tunnel you can see on the right hand side. This, this cavern has the detector in and the other one is a service cavern. So because, it's, because there's only 20 meters of rock over the top, we couldn't have one single span. We had to build, a, build what's called a pillar, a reinforced concrete uh, pillar in between the two caverns. So that we could take the loads of the, of the cavern lining onto these pillars to take, to take the uh, loading. But in fact, it worked out quite well because also we want to have an area in this cavern, not uh, with a detector inside, where people can access during operations. So it has to be radiation uh, shielded. So this, this pillar has two functions. One is to, to withstand the loads of these archers coming down onto the pillar, but also to act as radiation shielding so people can work safely inside this uh, cavern. So it's a seven meter thick pillar was constructed. That's the, the pillar when we, we finished excavating, seven meters wide, and uh, now we're getting ready to concrete the pillar. And then that's the finished pillar on the left-hand side completed. And now we're starting the excavation of the cavern. So the arch of the, of the roof is coming onto the pillar. Uh, and this is the old LEP tunnel being demolished, um, getting ready for the Large Hadron Collider. You can see the, the rock bolts and the shock creep in the background, the yellow wires of the instrumentation monitoring what's happening with the, uh, with the rock. 
That's the cavern virtually finished, the excavation, about 200,000 meters cubed. We're putting in the waterproof lining. So the, the, the primary lining of shotcrete is complete. Then there's a waterproof lining, then a secondary lining uh, on top of that. So if any water does penetrate it through the, through the primary lining, it's, it's trapped by this membrane. Uh, taken down to a drainage sump and pumped out. Obviously, we need our caverns to be very, very dry. We have sensitive equipment. That's the cavern concrete uh, nearly finished. We've finished all the walls. We're just getting ready to do the, um, the, 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 the concreting of the ceiling of the roof. This was a um, substantial amount of steel. It was 40 millimeter bars, uh, two layers on the front, two layers on the back. So everybody says, how do, we, how do we manage to get the concrete in with all this reinforcing steel? It was definitely... Uh, not going to move, that's for sure. It's a very stable cavern. That's the finished work, uh, all painted. That's the large Hadron Collider tunnel you can see there in, in the middle. And now we're getting ready for detector, detector assembly. Just a, just a quick word on the contract. So we use a FIDIC form of contract for the LHC, which we'll probably mention in his talk, was a modified version for the, for the high luminosity works. Why do we use FIDIC? Because it's, it's a well recognized for international projects. It's, it's good where that you have a, a client with an engineer doing the design, it's a re-measurement, and you have scope for variation orders, because it's, it's difficult to, to, to design these sort of works uh, definitively when you sign the contract, because things change quite a lot with regard to physics facilities and, and services that we're going to install. So we need a contract that's fairly flexible, and we have the adjudication process in, in, in the event of claims and disputes, and the same for high luminosity. Uh, so we had a panel of adjudicators. This was the first FIDIC contract to have a panel of adjudicators. And it's been continued on to the next uh, next project. Uh, project, and that's a, as built planning of the civil engineering. So basically, we started ninety eight, finished about two thousand and four, all the civil engineering works, and then started all the installation. The cost was about five hundred million Swiss francs at the time for civil engineering, twelve percent for the consultants and the architects, and then the rest for the works twenty six percent for surface and sixty two percent for the underground works. Just briefly uh, mention what, what goes inside this uh, this cavern, the CMS. So this is the detector. So the building was was built first, and then the, the, the detector people pre-assembled the detector on the surface and then loaded underground to, and via this new shaft uh, into the cavern. So it was just, it was delivered from all over the world. Those parts delivered from Pakistan, from Russia, from China, from all over the place. You can see all the different parts of the detector assembled using a, an 80-ton crane inside the building. But then we have to move these detector components, the biggest being 2,000 tons, down the shaft. So that was the, the issue we had. So we came up with this solution with a concrete sliding cover, uh, which you can see here being concreted. So this, this, this cover, um, that's it finished, now concreted. And you can see the rails. So this cover is jacked up first and jacked along these, these rails to cover completely the shaft. Then the detector itself, the 2,000 tons, we had a temporary crane uh, over the top of the building. You see the size of these beams, somebody standing up, so enormous um, beams were straddling the top of the building, a temporary crane. Then the, the, the detector um, components were slid on air pads, like mini, mini crafts, mini craft, hovercrafts, to slide the detector onto the concrete cover. The crane lifted up the, the detector components, the concrete plug sl slides back, takes about takes about an hour and then nine hours to lower the detector down underground. So that's the first or the biggest component, 2000 ton section being lowered down the shaft. These is, it's a strand jacking technique to lower the, the components down into the CMS uh, cavern. So that's the past. Um, and now Milton can talk about the, um, the, the present before we go back to the, into the future. So I'll stop sharing Milton, if you want to. Perfect, I will take over. Take over. Conseguem ver perfeitamente a minha apresentação? Ok, perfeito. Uh, tal como o John disse, uh, vamos falar agora do, do presente do, do CERN, que é o projeto que nós temos agora em mãos, que é o, que é o iLumi. Uh, mas antes de mais, eu gostava de agradecer ao, ao Mário e ao Instituto Superior Técnico pelo, pelo convite para, para participar na, na conferência. O meu nome é Milton Moraes, eu sou engenheiro técnico civil pelo Instituto Politécnico de Bragança e desde 98 até 2012 eh, trabalhei em Portugal em, em diversas empresas de construção civil e em 2012 fui convidado pela, pelo Grupo Ibil, pelo maior grupo de construção italiano e fui integrar a equipa de, na construção do, do metro de Copenhague, onde estive há cerca de seis anos e desde outubro de 2017 sou 
Construction Manager no, no, no CERN, em particular no, no projeto Bailumi, no, no ponto 1, na, na Suíça, mas uh, tenho entre, não só este, mas, mas outros, outros projetos. Um, tal como o João disse, uh, o nosso complexo de, de aceleradores é, é diversificado e, e, e já com alguma, com alguma idade, mas essencialmente no projeto iLuminosity e LHC, Uh, o, o intuito de toda a componente de construção civil, superfície e subterrâneo uh, visa criar uh, as infraestruturas necessárias para que os físicos possam criar cerca de 10 vezes mais colisões de partículas e logo um, um número maior de, de, de colisões, um número maior de experiências e um número maior de informação e, o, o, como é que eu ia dizer, a definição de luminosidade para, para, para os físicos é a quantidade de dados que conseguem recolher após cada, cada colisão. O projeto em si é, é, é constituído por um projeto gêmeo é, que, se, que tem uma parte da, da componente em, em França, é, em CSI, em CMS, onde o, onde o John trabalhou inicialmente, e uma segunda parte em Atlas, onde temos outro, outro dos detectores, na, na, na parte suíça. Aqui vocês podem ver um bocado a interação entre as, os trabalhos de superfície que, que nós também estamos a realizar nesta fase, mas sobre os quais eu não, não, não vou falar muito, porque acho que não, são edifícios industriais com uma componente técnica em termos de construção civil não são nada sofisticados. Depois, em termos de equipamentos, sim, aí a componente é muito, muito, muito mais sofisticada. E a parte de componente subterrâneo, como vocês podem ver, nós fizemos basicamente um poço de acesso ao subterrâneo, uma caverna e depois um componente de túnel com umas galerias, as quais depois interligamos com, com, com o LHC. Este é o projeto que nós temos no, no ponto 1 na, na, na parte suíça e este, e este, como vocês veem, com uma configuração ligeiramente diferente tendo em conta também a diferença de CMS e o espaço que, que, nos foi, que nós tínhamos como parcela para a construção dos edifícios na superfície, eh, ligeiramente diferente em termos de, de, de organização na, na superfície. Aqui, como podem ver, esta é a parte eh, de trabalhos de superfície que nós estamos neste momento em fase de conclusão. Temos um edifício de refrigeração do, do, do acelerador, Uh, ao lado temos um edifício onde temos eh, todos os compressores que são utilizados tanto pelo vácuo como pela, pela criogenia. Temos um edifício de ventilação que é o que trata o ar que é, é enviado para o subterrâneo e que é aspirado do subterrâneo, uma subestação elétrica e o, o edifício principal de acesso ao, ao subterrâneo com um reservatórios de hélio e uma, uma zona com uma, uma laje onde são instalados os filtros. Que o, que o CERN utiliza. Em termos de, de contrato, tal como o João referiu, nós também utilizamos neste caso o um FIDIC Red Book eh, da, da penúltima edição, eh, com a particularidade que temos para os dois pontos, diferentes engenharias que, tem, que tinham como, como escopo do seu trabalho o design e a supervisão da obra entre 2016 e 2022. No ponto 1, um, na Suíça, tínhamos uma, uma, uma joint venture constituída pela CETEC TPI, que é uma, um, um, um gabinete de, de, de engenharia francês, a Rock Soil italiano e a CSD eh, suíça. No ponto 5, tínhamos a, a Lombardi, que, que é um, italiana, a Artelia francesa e a Pini suíça. Uh, a ideia de separar as duas engenharias uh, tinha como função criar dois sistemas completamente independentes de, de, de gestão de projeto, para que não houvesse conflito eh, entre os dois, os dois pontos do, do trabalho. E o mesmo aconteceu na parte de, de construção, em que no ponto 1 um, tínhamos uma joint venture que era constituída por três empresas do, do grupo Marti, que é um grupo suíço que tinha um contrato de 53 meses, que está em vias de se terminar. E no ponto 5 foi constituído um, um consórcio entre um agrupamento de empresas de base em plena Suíça, mas também com a em plena França a participar e com a Alma Baracel e um contrato de, de 54 meses que também estamos né, em vias de, de conclusão. Em termos de obras subterrâneas, eh, como vocês podem ver, aqui temos o, mais uma vez o, o, o detector Atlas com todas as cavernas e, e poços que, 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 que existiam e nós, em termos de trabalhos, tivemos que criar um novo poço de acesso ao subterrâneo, que tem cerca de 10 metros de diâmetro interno, com 60 metros de, de, de profundidade. 
na, na base do poço, uma caverna com, com 50 metros de, de, de comprido, uma galeria principal, quatro galerias que depois no futuro vão fazer passar uh, tudo que é uh, networks para, para o acelerador e dois pontos, em cada, um em cada extremidade, com duas saídas de emergência, duas, dois pequenos, ou seja, duas pequenas galerias horizontais, um pequeno poço vertical e uma conexão com, com, com o LHC. Em termos de, de trabalhos, aqui podem encontrar o um, um, um resumo daquilo que foi o, o, o plano que foi estabelecido em, em 2015, quando do, 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 dos primeiros, da finalização dos estudos, um, e tínhamos alguns desafios uh, no projeto. Uh, a escavação do poço PM17, que vocês viram atrás, na, na imagem atrás, com o LHC em operação, o que nos levou a criar no, no contrato um artigo específico para a uh, utilização de uma escavadora elétrica com uma road header na, para a escavação do, do poço, a execução das duas ligações com, com o LHC, durante o, o, aquilo que vocês veem aqui como LS, LS2, é o Long Shutdown 2, ou seja, é um período em que o LHC é, é, é feito toda a sua revisão, podemos chamar de assim upgrade, de forma a que ele depois entra em funcionamento, que, que é o que está a acontecer neste momento. Tínhamos também a geologia da zona, que não é, não é, é boa, mas não é fácil. A existência de contaminação com hidrocarbonetos que, que, que existe nesta zona. E depois uma grande variedade de geometria nas, nas galerias do, do, do projeto. Agora o meu computador decidiu que não queria funcionar. E bloqueou. Ora, em termos de obras subterrâneas, como podem ver aqui, do, do lado esquerdo, temos a, a parte de, da geometria e da geologia que, que, que nós tínhamos previsto para, para a execução do, do trabalho. Inicialmente, eh, estava previsto de ser feito com, com ancoragens, mas o processo foi, foi alterado a pedido da, do, 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 nosso, do nosso contractor, do nosso empreendedor geral. Em termos de, de passos de escavação, tínhamos zonas mais e menos sensíveis, em que variavam entre, entre cerca de 1 um metro a 2 metros e meio. E com a particularidade que tínhamos no fundo do poço, este elemento de, 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 de geometria, que é um, um anel que nós criamos com, de reforço para estabilizar todos os trabalhos de escavação e de, e de suporte primário, vocês podem ver aqui com umas ancoragens a 45 graus eh, no sentido do, 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 da superfície, com uma, uma, uma geometria muito, muito, muito complexa e com um trabalho muito meticuloso da instalação de negativos para, para as, as ancoragens. Aqui podem ver uma sequência de fotografias entre o início da, da escavação, o, in, o anel que nós queremos na superfície para estabilizar numa, no, 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 na superfície para estabilizar a zona, as zonas de trabalho e depois as consequentes uh, escavação, aqui podem ver o sistema que nós utilizamos, em vez de, das ancoragens utilizamos umas, uma estrutura metálica de treliça, umas girders, que onde nós depois aplicávamos duas camadas de tão projetado, uma inicial de, de 5 centímetros para estabilizar o, o solo, depois tínhamos a, a instalação das, da, da estrutura metálica terliçada com a malha sol, depois 25 cm de tão projetado e depois em, e, finalmente esta parte aqui onde vemos a parte da execução do, do anel que, que foi feito no, no, no fundo do poço com a execução das ancoragens e aqui já com, com o, o poço con, concluído. Em termos da, da geometria da caverna, como vocês podem verificar, Tínhamos inicialmente previsto também um sistema semelhante em termos de escavação, com uma, uma particularidade, como vocês podem ver aqui, na parte superior da, da, da caverna, na zona em que se faz a interação entre o poço e a caverna, tínhamos identificado nas, nas sondagens geotécnicas uma zona frágil e, e o que aconteceu é que a escavação era feita, a parte superior da escavação foi partida em quatro partes, baseada no centro do, do poço e ela procedia um a 1B, 2A, 2B e depois baixávamos para o terceiro nível completo, para o quarto nível completo e depois no fim uma quinta, uma quinta parte de escavação que é a zona onde se situa o poço elevador e o, e o poço de, de, de bombagem. 
Aqui nas, nestas fotografias podem ver uma das secções de escavação de dimensão reduzida. Aqui nesta imagem podem verificar a contaminação com, com os hidrocarbonetos, que foi uma, uma constante. Uh, alguns equipamentos a trabalhar e como podem ver aqui já tínhamos iniciado a escavação do, do, do túnel, da UR15. E aqui um bocado a explicação, ou uma forma de, de organização do estaleiro, onde podem ver a, vent, a ventilação que foi instalada. O sistema que nós utilizamos para toda a escavação, fizemos oito, cerca de 80 mil metros cúbicos de escavação em todos os trabalhos de subterrâneo e foi todo o material foi retirado do, 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 do subterrâneo com uma caixa de, que tinha capacidade para apenas 10 metros cúbicos e aqui nesta, nesta área está um, a, a central de bombagem, que nós tínhamos, de bombagem de betão que nós tínhamos instalado no fundo do poço para procedermos a todos os, tra os trabalhos de, de execução do, do final learning. Aqui podem verificar os diversos tipos de galerias e túnel que tínhamos e as muitas secções que, que fomos obrigados a fazer para, para, para a execução do, do, dos trabalhos. Em termos de, de trabalhos de, de escavação, eh, o trabalho foi todo executado com o um método tradicional, escavadora com, com martelo, eh, instalação de, de estrutura metálica, rede malha-sol, botão projetado, eh, e aqui vem o o sistema que nós utilizamos com um BROC, com telecomando, para executar as duas pequenas galerias de conexão com o LHC. E aqui, nesta última fotografia, podem ver os trabalhos de, de, de ligação com o LHC. Estas pessoas, neste momento, estão a trabalhar com, com fatos completos, porque era uma zona em que nós tínhamos a presença de, de alguma radiação no, no botão e todos os elementos que foram... a roupa toda era deitada fora todos os dias e os equipamentos eram testados uma vez por dia no final do trabalho para verificar se havia contaminação com, com, com radiação do, da zona. Em termos de trabalhos de, de final lining, inicialmente a, a, a proposta que nós tínhamos apresentado com a engenharia previa a execução in situ do, da, do, do, da laje de fundo do, dos túneis, mas inicialmente o empreiteiro-geral apresentou-nos uma variante dessa proposta com a execução de, um, de, uma, de uma solução com, com pré-fabricados, com fibras, sem a presença de, 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 de armaduras de, de, de ferro. Foi criada uma estrutura, uma grua, que permitia o, a, o posicionamento destas peças em, em, a, de 1,50m de, de largura, eh, em que nós caminhávamos com a grua acima das peças enquanto, enquanto as, as instalávamos. Aqui podem verificar já algum avançamento com a parte da, das membranas de, de, de impermeabilização. Aqui uma interligação entre a geometria de uma, de uma, numa das galerias na que tem a forma de L, em que vemos esta zona que já está terminada e aqui nós estamos a preparar-nos para fazer entrar a cofragem para fazer a betonagem da última secção. Nesta fotografia podem verificar o sistema de cofragem que nós utilizamos. Tínhamos uma, uma cofragem hidráulica que permitia um ajuste vertical e horizontal de 20 cm em cada direção, que trabalhava sobre, sobre carris, a cofragem era posicionada, verificava-se a geometria e procedia-se à betonagem. Nas zonas entre as, as duas galerias centrais, que tínhamos cerca de 200 metros em telas, conseguimos chegar ao, ao, a betonar cerca de 9 metros por dia, fazíamos 45 metros por semana e aqui podem verificar já as galerias terminadas com o botão de, de, de atalochado que nós metemos no, no pavimento já terminado. Em termos da, da caverna, o sistema foi um bocado mais, mais complexo, eh, dada a dimensão da caverna. Eh, depois de terminarmos grande parte dos túneis, regressamos à caverna. Em termos de, de trabalho, nós fomos, começamos do ponto A e fomos até ao ponto B, e depois vimos com o final lining com, no, até o ponto A, que era o início da caverna, fizemos a execução da caverna e depois fizemos o, o poço. Um, com uma particularidade que na caverna fomos obrigados a utilizar membranas de, especiais por, por causa do contacto com, com os hidrocarbonetos, uh, aqui vem nesta fotografia central a cofragem dos, dos muros de fundo, aqui o muro de fundo já praticamente executado, onde faltavam cerca de 4 metros de tonar na, na, na parte superior. E depois o sistema de, de cofragem que nós utilizamos para, para, para a execução da caverna. A caverna foi feita em 5 tonagens, eh, em que fizemos as duas extremidades primeiro, depois regressamos ao centro e finalmente a parte onde tínhamos o, o anel, a zona de interseção, como vocês veem aqui, 
esta forma é particularmente complicada. Nós na obra chamávamos carinhosamente Pringle Shape, porque tem efetivamente a forma de uma, de uma batata Pringle e podem verificar aqui na, também a instalação de algumas... Tivemos muitas instalações no, no, no botão, entre Alpha Rails e, e placas para a instalação de gruas e a estrutura metálica depois do, do disco botado. Em termos do, do poço... Vocês podem ver aqui nesta fotografia, temos já a caverna toda terminada, pintada, com as estruturas metálicas a começarem. Tínhamos acabado de, de execução da, 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 do, das membranas de, de impermeabilização. Instalamos uma plataforma de trabalho a partir da qual fizemos os trabalhos no, 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 no poço. Deixamos aqui um pequeno negativo para passar com um, um, um elevador. Vocês podem ver aqui nesta fotografia, o elevador era uma cápsula que tinha espaço para, para três pessoas e que estava eh, suportada apenas por um cabo. Felizmente o cabo era verificado pelas autoridades suíças que, que são responsáveis pela, pelos, pelas telecabines no, na, na, nas montanhas. E aqui tínhamos o sistema de cofragem, é um sistema de cofragem eh, deslizante que, que, que sobe à medida da, da, da betonagem. Foi uma betonagem contínua de, de cerca de 10 dias, 60 metros, Fizemos 6 metros por dia, estamos a falar de que a cofragem subia a cada 15, 20 minutos, cerca de 2,5 cm. E na parte inferior eh, estava uma plataforma onde depois permitia o atalachamento do, do, do botão da, da caverna. E finalmente, queria-vos deixar aqui um, um pequeno vídeo em que vocês podem eh, verificar eh, o avançamento em termos de, de tempo dos trabalhos. Acho que o meu vídeo agora não quer funcionar. Bom, aqui vai. E foi esta a apresentação do, do projeto Ailumi. I will give, the, give back to John the... Okay. So that was uh, Ailumnosity. Now we move to the future um, studies that are being looked at by CERN. So the biggest one by far is what's called the Future Circular Collider. So it's a 100 kilometer tunnel uh, around the Geneva region. So you can see the, the existing Large Hadron Collider in blue, that's a 27 kilometers. And now we're looking at the dotted line, which is a, a new tunnel uh, going underneath Lake Geneva, around the back of what's called the Selev Mountain. This is the road going up to uh, Chamonix for any, any skiers amongst you. Back around and the pre -alp, towards the Prealps, and then back into the CERN region. So the LHC would be used as an injector into this new new machine. And in fact, the physicists aren't really sh aren't really certain what size machine they'll need. This is basically with a bigger machine, they get bigger energies, bigger collision uh, energy, basically. Um, and bigger intensities. But we were asked to buy from Silver Engineering what's the biggest possible machine we could build in the Geneva ba Basin for a reasonable cost. And this is what we came up with really, this 90 to 100 kilometer machine without going into the granite of the Alps or, or into a diff different area, difficult areas. So this is what we've been studying the last um, few years. Um, initially, when we started the study in 2012, 
we looked at different options for where we could house this new 100 kilometer machine. You can see the white now is the Large Hadron Collider, the 27 kilometers. So we thought about putting it to the, to the northwest of CERN, going fully into France in the Jura Mountains in the limestone, or going to the south um, west southeast of CERN, uh, going underneath the lake and around the back of this uh, Slav Mountain. So the one on the right hand side is what we call the lake side option. This, this stays in the molasses rock as much as possible. The one on the left was, was in the limestone rock, but they had pros and cons, both, both option. The one in the limestone was in a much less populated area, so it would have been easier to build the shafts. But after a, after a risk assessment of the two options, we decided that the least risk was the, the, the southeast option, the lakeside option, because we're staying in the molasses rock much as possible. To go in the, into the limestone in the Jura would have been quite risky with very deep shafts, the risk of very high water pressures and ingress into the into the tunnels and caverns. So for the last 10 years, we've been looking at what's the bottom right option, like what we call the lakeside option. So very early on, we took the digital approach. We employed a company called Arup in the UK to develop a, an optimization tool called TOT, Tunnel Optimization Tool, to very quickly look at as many different options of the tunnel uh, and, and get a, a good, good understanding of what the geology would look like, the depth, the shafts, etc., and to give us basically a cost estimate for, the, for this new machine. So we, we've done the, the past few years, we've gathered as much information that exists and fed it into this tool to try and come up with the best um, layout that we can for, for the tunnel. So first thing we had to get was the topography. So in the lake region, we're about 350 meters above sea level, but it gets much higher uh, on the other side of the slab up to, up to 600 or even 800 meters above sea level. So for this reason, we're, we're inclining the tunnel the same as the LHC, it's all inclined uh, towards Geneva to minimize the depth of the shafts. That's just a schematic of uh, what we're looking at. So that's the Large Hadron Collider, so underneath the lake, around the back of the slave. Um, th this one area here, you can see in the bottom is where we can't avoid the limestone rock. We have to go through limestone. Then we're back into the molasses, back into the Geneva Geneva Basin. So the critical, some of the critical areas are um, the, the lake, uh, underneath the lake, what depth could, do, we, do, do we need to go out to get into good material? Do we go into the molasses or do we, do, do we risk going through the glacial deposits? Uh, leaving the Geneva Basin where the Rhone River leaves underneath that and the, what's called the Vuash Mountains. That's quite a highly seismic uh, area for, for Switzerland anyway, not, not, nothing compared to something like Japan, obviously, but it's quite a seismically active area. So trying to avoid that as much as possible as well. Um, so the first thing we did was to define what's a reasonable boundary. So you can see the red polygon is the, is the area. We said the, this new machine could be somewhere within this, this sort of shape. So we've spent the last few years gathering all the information we could in this polygon shape and feeding into this uh, into this into this tunnel into this uh, tool. So, for example, underneath the lake, we, we were lucky enough to have some data from a, a proposed road tunnel underneath Lake Geneva. So we have these seismic um, soundings that were done from uh, the, if you look on the left hand side from a town called uh, Neon near Lausanne, going down the lake towards Geneva. And this is the long profile that we got from these uh, soundings. So you can see the, the this line here is the bottom of the lake is the is the, the level of the molass. So we're trying to stay in the molasses rock is, is our um, understanding. To, it's, it's safer to stay in the, in the molasses rock. But at one point, we did look at different options. So the molasses from a civil engineering point of view is the, is the, is the safest. We did think about going through the moraines at one point with a different type of tunnel boring machine to go from the molasses through these glacial deposits with the risk of water and then back into the uh, molasses. We've even considered an immersed tube tunnel type technology to stay as shallow as possible. So that minimizes the depth, depth of the shafts all around the ring. But we've more or less excluded the, uh, well, we have excluded the immersed tube tunnel option. We're not too keen on the moraine option. We're trying to get a, a, a layout that works for the molasses option underneath the lake. But I mean, an immersed tube tunnel would have been possible. In fact, I worked on two immersed tube tunnels in England. This is one in the, in the, in the south of England, where you precast the tunnel segments and float them out under the, under the lake of the river. But because mainly for um, stability reasons for the tunnel, we need very stable tunnels for our physics machines. We've, we've excluded this, uh, this option. So then back to the tool. So we fed all this information in uh, into this tool, including um, anything we can get in hydrogeology, uh, on um, sensitive areas, protected areas, uh, construction uh, buildings we fed into the tool. We even fed in um, any geothermal drillings that exist uh, around the area. And then with that, the tool, we can then look at different options. So this is a zoom on the tool. Uh, this particular example, we had the tunnel elevation at the center of 310 meters above sea level. It's a 93 kilometer machine. 
and we have a 0.5% um, slope of the whole 93 kilometer machine. Then uh, we can basically drag and drop uh, the tunnel in different areas. Unfortunately, it's not a fully automated machine learning type uh, algorithm behind this. It's a manual um, uh, to user, user um, tool. Uh, you can get different layers. You can look at satellite images, the faulting, rivers, protected areas, etc. And this is what the tool then, then gives you automatically generated profile around the ring. So this is the 93 kilometers from shaft A going underneath the lake between shafts B and C. So we're in the, the molasses rock, which is a brown. Uh, going around, then it gets very, very deep underneath the, the pre-alps. This, this greyish area is between shaft H and I, is where we have to go through the limestone rock. We can't avoid it. And coming back into the CERN region around shafts K and L, the limestone here we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to find a profile that stays on the last rock as much as possible. It's not this funny shape that you can see here. This is the because in the tool, we artificially uh, flattened the surface of the earth. That's why I get a funny sine wave type uh, shape for the tunnel. But in fact, all that is the tunnel inclined in one plane. It's because we've artificially flattened the earth that you get this funny, uh, funny shape. And the tool then gives you the geological profile and also the depth of the shafts. You can see here, uh, the deepest shaft in this particular case was 311 meters deep. And then you get this profile around the ring. Uh, this is an 86% in the molasses rock, 7% in limestone. So it's been a very successful tool for us to very quickly look at many, many different options and see what's reasonable in the, in, in the Geneva region. For the cost estimates, we've had to come up with the lining concept for the tunnel. So the orange is, is the molasses. So this is the, the best uh, conditions. Where well, we've gone for what's called option one, which is a precast uh, segmental lining uh, tunnel boring machine. Option two is when we think there's a risk of water. So, for example, underneath the, rake, underneath the lake, there is a risk of some water ingress. So we've gone for a bigger tunnel uh, with a possibility of waterproof membrane and in situ concrete. And then options three and four are for the mine tunnels in the, in the limestone rock um, drill and blast type uh, tunnels. So what it looks like, the, the Large Hadron Collider in this 3D schematic is at the top. That's the, the L, in grey, that's LHC. Then we need new injection tunnels coming down to the Future Circular Collider, shown in blue. And then we'd have, similarly to the LHC, we've, we're costing four detectors in these red caverns. These are the very big caverns where the particles are made to collide. And the service shafts every uh, 10 kilometres or so, shown in, uh, in green. So that's where the technical service is coming down to the, to the tunnel. And we also, unfortunately, have to have these little alcoves every uh, one and a half kilometres to house equipment, uh, for, to radiate radiation shielded equipment. At one point, we did consider a double tunnel because it's 100 kilometres with, with more than 10 kilometres between the shafts. So we thought for transport purposes, it would be better to have a, the machine tunnel and then a separate tunnel for transport and for, for safe evacuation where people could escape in the case of a problem into this into this tunnel. But mainly for cost reasons, uh, we have rejected this uh, this option and now we're sticking with a single tunnel. But in fact, safety is a very strange, um, it's very strange at CERN. There's no legislation to build a particle physics accelerator. You can't look, compare it to a road tunnel or a railway tunnel because there's no flammable equipment in the, in the tunnel as such, not like a road tunnel. And there's nobody in our tunnels when it's operation. We can't have people in the tunnels for radiation. So it's totally different to a normal tunnel. So we think a single tunnel about six meters is possible for the LHC, uh, for the FCC. And we've gone for a um, smoke compartment. So every 600 meters or so, we're going to have a barrier uh, where in the event of a problem, the doors could close and seal off the problem area. We switch off the air supply, but there's still an air, air extraction in that area. So this is what we've adopted for the for the studies to take forward. We've done some structural analysis of the of what the caverns might look like in the deep underground in this type of rock, but we haven't done any site investigation as yet. This is what we're planning to do now in the next uh, next few years. So we're now uh, identifying what we call the high risk areas where there's the greatest uncertainty for the geology and there's a risk of um, if we do some site investigation, it could change the alignment of the tunnel horizontally and vertically. So now we're planning a site investigation camp campaign. The red area is what we call the high risk, high risk areas and the, the, the amber uh, areas. We're also doing site investigation, budget permitting. The green areas, we think we have enough information so we don't need to do investigation. So for example, underneath the lake, we're now planning to start um, drillings and seismic, um, uh, seismic campaign in the very near future. The tenders are now out for this. We've already uh, collected 
um, some inf as much information as we can, and we've identified where we think these high risk areas are. And the tenders are out at this very moment for the consultants, and the tenders for the contractors will go out uh, towards the end of this year. We're planning to start on site in 2023. <clears throat> so you can see in this simplified planning here, the red is the, um, the site investigation works. So the, the, the call for tender of the consultants is now out. We're hoping to place this contract very, very soon. Uh, the consultants will then start uh, defining in detail what the, we want the contractors to do with regards to site investigations. Then we'll start the tenders for the contractors and the geophysics are planned to start at the end of 23 and then the, the drillings all of 24. But it's very important we have this information uh, all, all documented in 2025 because we have what's called the European Strategy for Particle Physics update in 2627. When the, it's, the, it's when all the European or worldwide physics, physics, physicists come together, look at all the different proposals and then uh, give some recommendations on what to do next. So we're not, we haven't got approval to build this project. We have approval for site investigation to feed into this European strategy update in 26, 27. And then we're hoping to start construction shortly afterwards, uh, this project. So these sort of projects, you look at a 20 year, 20 year span from first conception to, to construction, basically. This is what we've seen for LEP, for LHC and for high luminosity. And it's very similar for future future circular collider. So we're hoping to start construction in the, in the mid 2030s, which sounds a long way off, but it's not. Uh, and then, because uh, we're already behind program to, to start in the mid, mid 2030s, about a 10 year construction program to be in time to, to do physics after the end of the high luminosity physics program. Uh, so that's, that's our long term plan. Cost estimate is about 6 billion Swiss francs with a work with a company called ILF Consulting to come up with this cost estimate. And that is just for the civil engineering. So it's 6 billion Swiss francs, the tunnel shafts and some surface buildings. That's without any uh, mechanical infrastructure like ventilation systems, electrical systems, or the machine itself, or the detectors. But it's quite uh, an early stage uh, cost estimate. Apart from that, there's many other uh, projects at CERN we're studying. One, one example is a linear collider called Click. Uh, it's a, co a compact linear collider. So this machine, um, the advantage of a linear collider is you can build it in stages. So there's a plan to build phase one for certain energy shown by the pink dot. So about 10 kilometers length. And then you could get the, the machine installed, start physics while you work on phase two and phase three. So similarly similarly to uh, FCC, it's, it's, a, it's a huge project straddling the French Swiss border. And we were trying to avoid the, 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 the limestone rock again. This is a typical tunnel cross section. So the, one of our biggest challenges at CERN is to, to decide what size tunnel and, and, and shafts and caverns we need to build. It involves hundreds of people to, to understand what do we need to build? All the integration is, is very complicated. We use a software called CATIA to do 3D modeling. And then, then we can start thinking about what size tunnel we need to build. So this is an example of the click tunnel showing the machine, the ventilation systems, the cable trays, etc. Again, for click, we developed the software tool, uh, top TOT, to, to get the tunnel and the, the molasses as much as possible. Uh, it's only one end if we go to the third phase that we'd have to go into the limestone, limestone rock. Um, so this just shows the number of people involved. It's a really worldwide worldwide collaboration for different different countries developing electrical systems, survey systems, and it's the same for the future circular collider. Electrical supply is a big deal. <clears throat> Can the network actually supply these machines? The FCC is about a 400 mega, megawatt machine, so it's a big uh, big undertaking. It does the network uh, exist to, to to feed our machines? So it's a big part of the study. All the integration models, for example, these little alcoves every 1.5 kilometers. It's a huge amount of work to, to do all the integration before we can even start looking at the, the civil engineering designs. Safety considerations are obviously fundamental. These are the, this is the system I mentioned with these barriers every every few hundred meters along the tunnel, which close in the event of a, a fire or incident. These barriers can close. We turn off the air supply, but we still have um, uh, a possibility to escape. To escape. Apart from that, there's much smaller scale um, studies that are being looked at, uh, not, not as big as the circular collider or the, or the linear colliders. We have about 10 different studies on the table. I just mentioned one briefly called the beam dump facility, which is, which is um, this one here. It's for a, a new um, fixed target experiment. You can see just at the top there in red. So we'd, we'd extract the beam from one of the existing tunnels, divert it off down this red tunnel, 
and this is a shallow tunnel in this case, it's, it would be cut and cover type uh, construction into a fixed target in an experimental area. This is just one of many studies that we're looking at uh, at CERN for the future, which will all feed into this European strategy update in the next in the next few years. So in summary, um, civil engineering is, is fundamental to these projects. Without, without our tunnels and, and, and caverns that we're building, there wouldn't be any physics. So it's really important that we, we get a good grip on the, on the civil engineering and the infrastructure costs and schedule to understand what is possible and what's not possible. And the site investigation contracts are starting very, very soon for, the, for this uh, future cellular Clyde. I'll just take the opportunity for one more slide to say it's not all physics at CERN. As I said, there's, right at the start of this presentation, there's 10 times more engineers and, and, and technicians at CERN than there are physicists. We have lawyers, accountants, even our own fighters, like 70 or 80 firefighters at CERN. And, and uh, so please don't think it's just for uh, physicists at CERN. And in fact, even in my very small little team, I have a few positions coming up soon for civil engineers. One is for uh, a staff position to look at tunnel asset management, so the monitoring of all the existing tunnels at CERN. Unfortunately, that's not uh, um, for a master degree level engineer, it's for a, what we call a technical engineer. Uh, but that, that position will be coming out very, very soon. And then also we have what's called the fellowship program at CERN, um, which, is, which is designed for normally for people that are graduated uh, less than a few years after, after the final studies, but hopefully with a, few, a bit of work experience. But for the FCC site investigation, I'm sure there'll be opportunities coming up when we start the site investigations on site next year. So please, if anybody's interested, um, you can apply online via the CERN jobs um, link. So I think we're, we're finished. Hope we under, didn't drag on too long. Both your presentations. Um, can, can, do, we have, uh, do you have some time for questions? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, In English for me though, please. <laughs> um, I, I can reply in both languages. <laughs> Uh, do you hear him? Just, Just about, about yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I have a question which is how much innovation was and will be needed to do in terms of tools and machinery to be able to do such a big project? It's a question about innovation. Is that the topic? Yeah. Well, our tunnels, you might think, are totally different to, uh, to normal subway tunnels or road tunnels. But in fact, there's many, many similarities with our tunnels. So the innovation for the industry that's already going on helps us a lot. So we've learned a lot recently. For example, I mentioned about the ground freezing technique. That was very uh, innovative at the time. Um, and now for the future, for the new projects, we're looking, okay, one of the big aspects, aspects of course, is the, is the sustainability, sustainability issue. issue. So for the future circular collider, we're going to have about 10 million meters cubed of rock to be excavated. And I think gone are the days where we can just send this to a disposal um, site. So one key aspect of innovation is what can we do with this material? Traditionally, the molasses rock is not very useful material, especially it has a high clay content. So in contact with water, it's not very um, stable. So it's not particularly good for concrete or for road construction. So that's one area where we really need some innovation on what we can, can we do with this uh, with this rock. Uh, another area is is uh, is energy. We're, we're, a, we're a big user of, of energy at CERN, as I mentioned, maybe 400 megawatts for the FCC. So we're looking at innovation on uh, how to improve that situation, even from civil engineering. Can we think about heat recovery, for example, getting heat from the rock because we're deep, under, deep underground in a system of pipes, maybe in the tunnel lining, send it to the surface for, for, for useful purposes. So there's lots of innovation that we're looking at at CERN to, for the future, but it is quite innovation that you'd have in a normal normal, normal tunneling industry. It's not much different to, uh, to, to, to what goes on in, in industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have an, another question. Um, what's the name of Eu gostava de saber, na, na, nas diversas uh, 
peças que foram construídas, que foram construídas na, neste, neste projeto, nas diversas peças em betão armado, qual foi a maior peça que foi construída de forma contínua e se tiveram problemas com juntas de expansão que são normais em, em qualquer projeto de betão armado. Obrigado. É. Uh, não, posso, posso, posso responder. Não, 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 não. No, no caso do, do, do Ailumi, uh, a nossa maior tonagem foram cerca de 450 metros cúbicos na execução da, da caverna. Uh, não foi particularmente. Ou seja, é uma tonagem de demorada, é certo. Era um trabalho que nós começávamos normalmente. As, as cinco grandes tonagens que fizemos na caverna começavam cerca das seis da manhã e terminavam por, por volta das. 6, 7 da tarde. Estamos a falar de 12 horas de tonagem contínua com o Self Compact Incomplete e não tivemos problemas em, em, em particular no, no caso do, do, do projeto Evo. Portanto, isto, esta peça tinha essa, essa dimensão enorme e não, não houve necessidade de fazerem juntas de expansão no, 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 no botão armado. Uh, tinha, nós tínhamos 5 juntas de tonagem. Uh, mas não, não, não houve nenhuma junta de, de, de expansão. A única junta de expansão que, que temos é nas duas ligações entre a, a, a caverna e as duas galerias que saem da caverna, aí sim, porque depois temos um elemento com 300 metros de comprido, que é, que é a galeria, e ao lado tínhamos outra com 70 metros, mas foram as duas únicas que executamos. Tudo o resto são juntas de tão normal. Obrigado. Mais uma questão? Boa tarde. Relativamente a essa as bombas aguentaram? Como é que foi essa logística? O que nós fazíamos, nós bombávamos o botão da superfície para o subterrâneo. Tínhamos, entras, não tínhamos um tubo de queda, porque a bombagem era, era controlada. No subterrâneo, a 85 metros de profundidade, tínhamos uma, uma bomba com uma, com uma misturadora, onde fazíamos nova remistura do botão para, para evitar a segregação. Fazíamos slump tests outra vez e a partir daí bombávamos em, em, para, para, para a zona de tonagem. Isso no, em termos de tonagem, se calhar em termos de complexidade, parece muito complexo. Porque os caminhos chegam na superfície, distribuem o botão, entregam o botão a uma bomba que bomba para, para, para o subterrâneo e depois no subterrâneo temos outra bomba que, que bombava para... Na, para, 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 na, neste caso na caverna que era a maior tonagem no caso das, das galerias nós tínhamos, o nosso sistema de compragem de, bomba, de compragem tinha duas bombas de tonagem acopladas e nós tonávamos simetricamente um, de cada um dos lados da, da, da cofragem e o único cuidado que tínhamos de ter em particular era, era fazer teste, principalmente o slam porque com 80 metros de, de, de queda do botão tínhamos algum receio de que houvesse alguma segregação, mas efetivamente não tivemos nenhum, nenhum problema em particular. Foi, por acaso foram a qualidade do botão, no, particularmente no ponto 1, no ponto 5 também muito boa, mas no ponto 1 extraordinário. Sim, mas as bombas em si, voltar esse tempo todo a confinar, Duas bombas, uma para substituir a outra quando é necessário, mas não tivemos nenhuma avaria. A única avaria que tivemos durante a execução da, os, dos trabalhos que foi crítica foi na, na Grua Ponte, que tínhamos na superfície, e, e que infelizmente tivemos que fazer vir os técnicos de, de, da Holanda em que perdemos dois dias e meio de trabalho com a avaria da Grua. Obrigado. Mais alguém tem alguma questão? We have another question. Uh, in our part uh, of the similar excavation, uh, is it able to use the uh, boring machine? Uh, we use tunnel boring machines. In fact, for the, for the LHC construction, we used uh, there's two tunnels, two injection tunnels, about two, two and a half kilometers long. One tunnel we did with a, with a TBM, with a tunnel boring machine, and one tunnel we did with a road header. And in fact, it was quite an interesting exercise because we learned that um, you gain a lot of time up front with, a, with a, like a road header type machine because you can immediately start with the shaft excavation and then once you're at the bottom of the shaft, you can continue. Whereas the tunnel boring machine, you need about six, three to six months of time to set the machine up before it gets going. Then obviously the production ends much, much faster. 
we get about roughly 30 meters per day with a, with a tunnel boring machine and about 30 meters per week with a road header for a standard tunnel. So we've, we've learned that uh, anything less than two kilometers, there's no point in using a tunnel boring machine because they both finished at exactly the same time or as these two tunnels I'm talking about. So if it's more than two kilometers, it's worthwhile for a tunnel boring machine. If it's less than a road header. Yeah, just a setting out time for the for the TBM, you lose the. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Okay, thank you. You can show I think we have the uh, the last question. Okay. <laughs> de C2025 para enchimentos para criar plataformas de trabalho até C4045. Uh, so, um, with no more questions, um, in behalf of Forum Civil, I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. John and Mr. Milton, for being here with us. We would prefer it was if it was um, in person. And no, no, we will go to Lisbon just to get the beer. <laughs> Next time. Uh, thank you a lot. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, we can end the presentation. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you. I want to pass the, the uh, to my colleague Raquel. She's going to. Um, in the ninth edition of the Journal Civil. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, amanhã também vamos ter o concurso internacional, temos a fase local, onde quem ganhar uh, a fase local pode ir até a Romênia com tudo fácil. Portanto, incentivo-vos também a, a criar uma equipa de três elementos. Hoje é o último dia de inscrição, portanto, apressem-se e espero ver-vos a todos amanhã. Obrigada. Só um bocadinho, agora eu vou... Can you hear me?